Thank you so much for joining us today for Secret Smithsonian Nooks and Crannies, Uncovering the Lost Order with Steve Barry. I am Gabriella Khan from the Smithsonian Library's Advancement Team, and I am so pleased to welcome you to our program. I want to gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway on whose ancestral homelands I live, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. Before we get started, I want to go over a few things. Your mics are automatically muted for the duration of the event, and you will not be on video. We are recording the program so that we can share it with those who weren't able to join us today. If for any reason you are disconnected, please click on the link you clicked on to get here and you should be able to rejoin. You'll see a toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to use the chat feature to introduce yourself and to interact with your fellow Smithsonian Library's friends. However, if you do have any questions for our speakers, please submit them at any point through the Q&A feature. And that will make sure that we don't miss those questions during our Q&A portion at the end. So we hope that everything will go as smoothly as possible, but just in case there are any hiccups, please bear with us. Again, we are recording the program so that we can share it with those who aren't able to tune in or if there are any technical issues. And just like so many of you, our speakers are at home today. So please excuse any potential background sounds or any surprise visitors. So our, our program today, um, it, it really needs very little introduction. Uh, and I know you're all as excited as I am to hear from our incredible speakers about how the Lost Order brought the Smithsonian, our collections, our staff, and, and even our buildings to life. And of course, I know you're really looking forward to getting to ask them your questions. So Steve Barry is not only a New York Times and number one internationally best-selling author of 19 novels, but he is also an emeritus member of the Smithsonian Library's advisory board. And his brilliant marketing maven wife, Elizabeth Barry, served on the Smithsonian Library's advisory board education committee. And we were, and we continue to be so lucky to benefit from their expertise and support. And I am just so thrilled that they're here today. So Steve and Liz, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Gabby. <laughs> that was a nice introduction. Nice. I'm worried that there are gonna be surprise visitors though. Yeah, I'm looking at the <laughs> door to make sure nobody comes in here. So I told Steve <laughs> if the doorbell rings, we just pretend that we're not home. So we're not here. Yeah. Not here. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you for supporting the Smithsonian Libraries by being here. We wanted to say a special thank you to Gabby and, and the team, Eliza and Allie and um, everybody for having us. Um, the Smithsonian Libraries are so close to our heart. I also want to say hello to a lot of our friends that are on this mm -hmm. chat. I feel like you guys have heard us speak way too many times and you're just here because you care about us and you're our friends. So thanks for being here. We are in sunny Florida. It's a little chilly today. It's about what? 75. About 75. So we got to wear it's long chilly sleeves. For us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think we covered all, all of the thank yous and the, the doorbell disclaimer in case somebody visits. We're here to talk about The Lost Order. Yes. It, uh, which was a Cotton Malone novel that was published in 2000 and 17. Yes. <laughs> uh, a little background so you know a little bit of how this works. I got the idea for this novel in 2013. I researched it in 14. I wrote it in 15. I turned it in in 16 and it was published in 17. So that shows you the, the progression of how long it takes for a novel to come together. I was serving on the library advisory board at the time I came on in 11, I believe, 2011 on the board. And I would, we would have meetings three times a year uh, up in, in uh, various places, usually in DC. Right. And as you do in meetings, you sometimes your mind begins to wander and you kind of drift I, and you're not. I didn't hear you <laughs> well, it happens that. sometimes. Did? I mean, it does. And he, really, he did, Allie, he didn't. Well, that, actually I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the meetings are all day long and sometimes it drifts. So, I, I was sitting in there, I remember in 2013, and this idea of a novel began to gel in my head, it began to come together, and I began to see that I'd like to focus on something with the Smithsonian. Yeah. You were there, you remember. Yeah, I do. It's, it's really interesting because 
I've been part of this process for a long time and watching Steve come up with novels. And it's fascinating because we'll be walking somewhere, doing something, he'll see something in a book or in a magazine or the news. And he'll say, okay, we got to go there. We got to see about this. But this novel was different because we were there so much that you became fascinated. We, we <laughs> both became fascinated with the Smithsonian Castle and the different institutions and the different libraries. And I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this gelled in a really real way over a course of time. It did. And what, yeah. what you may not understand is in every museum of the Smithsonian, every single museum, there's a library. Right. You don't know it's there, you don't see it, but it is there. And it is literally, and I'm not making this up, I'm very serious about this, it is literally the heart of that museum. All the information, all of the research, all of everything that goes into what's in that museum, all of that material is in the library there. And there's yeah. 21 Smithsonian libraries scattered across America and one down in Panama. So there's a lot of them with a lot of information. I like to say it's the largest repository of knowledge in the world, but the Library of Congress takes a little issue with that. <laughs> but so, uh, but I, was, I, we yeah. learned so much from, from the libraries and particularly when we were in the castle and the Smithsonian Castle, it was probably the first element that came it together for, for this book. And what happened was I, I, I met the curator of the castle, a man named Rick Stam, mm -hmm. and I asked him, could I see the castle? Could you just tell, you know, after, the, after one of the, library board meetings, could, could we just have a, a walk around? And Elizabeth and I went over there one afternoon and he took us around for about two hours. And we went into every nook and cranny in the castle. We went up in the towers. We went all through the staircases. No, this is the best. We're in his office, his office is in the basement. And he said, you know, I don't know if you're interested, but you see that over there, that's a secret door that opens to a <laughs> spiral staircase that no one ever has really gone up in you know, a couple hundred years or whatever. And at the top is like this turret. And he and Steve and I are looking at him like, yeah, yeah see that. I think we would Actually, open what, a secret door. What they did is they created a, a spiral staircase in one of the towers because the uh, in the 19th century, the Smithsonian Castle was actually uh, not only a museum, but it was also a workable scientific laboratory. And they were doing research there and they were doing experiments there. And it was a way to go quickly from the top down to the bottom, to the, to the basement. And it's there, they discovered it uh, uh, about a decade ago, opened it back up. It's in the novel, it's so all there, cool. it's all there. We're going through all of these things. And by the way, all of this is on the C-SPAN show that I believe is gonna, you'll have a link to that, that was sent out to you. C-SPAN recorded this entire thing that we, we took through. So you, you can actually- You can see it too. You can walk it with yeah. us and see, yeah. see everything that was there. But we were just about done. And all at once he says, and you know about the tunnel, right? And I go like, no, I, I don't really know anything <laughs> about it. Steve was about to have a fit. He was I said, what? Tunnel? What, what, what do you mean tunnel? Uh, he said, well, come here, I'll show you. Yeah. And so we, we go there, we're in the basement of the, of the castle and there's a tunnel and let me get something. I got it right over here. I, you I guys, have, I'm a little embarrassed because this looks like we- I happen to have this with me. I carry it with me wherever I go. He's so excited to show you guys though. So here we go. Here, here, here. Uh, Rick, actually, uh, Rick, Rick actually produced this for me, which was really nice. We used it the night that we did a presentation. We had a, um, a Smithsonian Libraries fundraiser and uh, people paid uh, 50 people paid $1,000 to come and they got to take the tour that we took and all of that money went to the Smithsonian Library. And this is what he had on display that night. Right, so down here is the it's castle. It's the castle, the castle's yeah. right here. Right. And what they did is when they built the castle and then when they built the American History Museum over here, they ran a tunnel all the way, that black line, that tunnel goes all the way under the National Mall. Mm -hmm. And if you go up there in the winter time, and look, you will see a straight line where no snow is all the way across. Because what happens is the boiler for the castle was over here in this museum. And so they ran the heat lines underneath all the way over to here. And the tunnel's still there mm -hmm. and it still exists. And it's very tight down there. It's not a place they go very often. It's very hot, it's very uncomfortable, but you know, I mean, come on, for me, this was, <laughs> This was catnip. Like, yeah, <laughs> this was this was gold. So uh, it had to be in the novel, and so the, it plays a very critical role in the novel itself. And and I and I built a lot of the scenes around it. For me, and this is one of the things with my books that are different from others' books. These places are not backdrop for my novels. 
the places are intricate to the story itself. The scenes could not take place any place else in the world, but in these places, because the places become a character in the story. And this tunnel was definitely one of those. In the uh, early part of the 20th century, they used to go hunting down there, he told me. And I said, well, what do you hunt? They said they hunted rats. Big giant rats live down in this tunnel. They used to super go. scary. They don't have those anymore, <laughs> but they do. I will put it back, I'll put it back. I'll, I'll put it back. <laughs> I hope you guys like that. It's just too cool that we have we happen to have this, so we took it off the wall to show you. Yeah, he he. It was yeah. really great that he made yeah. that for me, and we we took everyone. They got to see the entrance to the tunnel. Couldn't go into the into it. Um, the heat lines are still there. They still run across. Now communication lines are down there, and there's mm -hmm. other stuff down there as well. And it's not actually a tunnel. They didn't bore burrow it in the ground. They mm -hmm. dug a trench, right. built it into the ground and then covered it over right. and then it became became there but a lot of people don't even know that it exists right there but it in the novel it plays a critical critical role yeah it's huge two other places that we love that also were terrific for the novel the american history museum and the natural history museum yeah, particularly, particularly natural history. history yeah because they took us over there <laughs> and they took a tour and they are at the time were completely redoing the uh, the prehistoric section of the of the museum the whole area was closed off completely and I, I said please can I go in there because that may be what I'm looking for and I, we went in there we went around and it was perfect because you know the museums are crowded so how am I going to have scenes in there where right. people are getting chased and shot at or whatever well I can do it in the in the construction area right. where there's no one there. There was an exhibit there uh, that they were getting ready to dismantle completely. And I found it fascinating. So I worked it into the novel as well. There's something hidden in there. All of that's there. I'm gonna be very careful what I say to the novel. Some of you have not read it. I don't wanna right. give anything away, but all of that was conceived while we were there. What you do not know probably is there is a multitude of back doors and back corridors mm -hmm. in all of the museums that the staff uses. And those are incorporated into the novel as well, as well as one of the reading rooms. It's a private uh, collection area that's in the American History Museum that is in the novel. There's a whole scene that takes place in there with Cotton Malone. Right, because so, when you were doing the novel, one of the things that we're always trying to find is how can you have these scenes and how can you have these secret places? And you're talking about some of the most visited places in the world. Yeah. So between the castle, using the tunnel, using the turret, using this, those secret places and the night, of course, the, the dark of night. Yeah, and, and, yeah. The, and places that are secure and, and locked off, that's all got to work into it. And again, I wanted the, the, the Smithsonian to become a character in the story. Yeah. And another thing about the novel is very interesting is a secret society, because in all my novels, we have that. Mm -hmm. And this one has one as well. It's called The Knights of the Golden Circle. Uh, it was real. It was created in the 1850s. It's basically a boys club at the time. It was just a social gathering club. It evolved into something much more. It eventually became in the 1860, 1861, to 1865, the counterintelligence arm of the Confederacy. Uh, they engaged in a lot of activities. They basically were sent to the north to wreak havoc in the north. They would go into a town and just wreak total terror and havoc. That's what they specialized in. Their job was to, to disrupt northern uh, stability. They were really good at it. They were good at spying. But the one thing they were best at of all was... Stealing. stealing. They love to steal. <laughs> Particularly yeah. gold and silver. Gold right? and silver. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. looted a national mint. They stole gold and silver from banks, people, wherever they could get it. Lots of it. But what did they do with it? This is what. This is what's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. They took it and buried it all across Arkansas, Missouri, yep. Tennessee, all up in that area. They buried it in the ground in little separate caches all yep. over the place. Just and, buried it. And yeah and left clues right. in the trees, in the rocks, carved onto the trees. Trees were cut in such a way so they would grow pointing a particular way. There was a, they had a, their own language of which they led. And then they left men in charge of each of these areas called sentinels. And their job was to look after these caches. And this existed to this day. Some of these have been found, have been dug up and located. None of the big ones though have ever been found. And that fascinated me. So I, I incorporated, of course, the Knights of the Golden Circle had to be into yeah. the and novel. And you started the novel with Cotton. They kind of- Going dealing, after yeah, one, of the, right. one of the caches, going yeah. after that and dealing with a sentinel 
and, and, and in Arkansas, we went to uh, Northwestern Arkansas to a place called Eureka, which is a magnificent town. We went to the Books and Bloom Festival. Hello, Books, Books and Bloom. Bloom. It, was it was a great one, yeah. Uh, if you've never been to Northwestern Arkansas, it is like a little paradise yeah. up there, it's beautiful. But south of there is where a lot of these were buried and over into Missouri, a lot were buried and they're still there. And those clues are still there on the ground. And no one to this day has ever really located any of the substantial finds. That we it, know of. That we know of. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the reason why it makes a good lot of sense, all this, a lot of this land now is privately owned. You just can't romp around and go searching for treasure. You have to get permission right. from the landowners right. to go to get it. Now, in, my, in the novel, I put mine on uh, national park property. And there is some on national park there as well. But then the real rumor was, is a lot of it was dug up in the early part of the 20th century, taken to the Southwest United States and hidden away in a super vault there right. in the ground. And that's what I incorporated into the story. Yeah. And for those of you who might not know, um, Steve's protagonist, his hero, his main character, his name is Cotton Malone. Cotton Malone. And uh, his real name is Harold Earl Malone. Harold Earl Cotton Malone. Yeah. I named him after my father, who's Harold Earl Berry. For all his life, though, he's been called Sam, and nobody knows why, not even right. he. He doesn't even know why they call him Sam. Right. <laughs> so I incorporated that Harold Earl Malone, but they call him Cotton. But there's a reason why they call him Cotton, and the Lost Order is the book that explains that yeah. with a true story from the Civil War of a real character yeah. from the Civil War that I incorporated into Cotton's family history. I think you'll find him fascinating. He was the greatest spy of the Confederacy, and you'll find some a very interesting story about him. Yeah, and you, just as a side note, if you haven't read Steve, you don't have to read his books in order, even though it's a series, he writes them all so that they stand alone. So if you want to start with this one, you're not going to be confused. He writes them so that you'll understand. That's a great plug. Well, I, I feel bad because like some of, I think some of my friends might be on here that maybe haven't read you yet because they love you. Yeah. But they might not have read you. So Keep I just plugging, wanted to, you're doing good. I just want to clear that up. Okay, back to this book. Magnet, let's, I I, sorry, let's talk about James Smithson. James Smithson. Mm -hmm. He is the man. He's the, the guy. He, he left. He got. He left a bequeath of money. He actually left it to his uh, to his nephew, but that he died before he could inherit. And there was a uh, caveat in the will that said, if there's no one to inherit the money, then it will go to the United States of America to establish a a center of learning um, and is kind of remarkable that he did that because James Smithson never set foot in America. Mm -hmm. He never came here. He never was here. Why did he choose that? Why did he say, I'm going to leave this money and I want you to create it? And so sure enough, he died. There were no one there. We sent an emissary over there. It spent several months in the uh, um, state courts and they finally got the money, put it on the ship, brought it back. And then Congress fought about it for a long time, like 15, 20 years, they fought and fought and fought of what to do. Because at this time, there was a great fear. The, the Southern states thought it would become an anti-slavery organization. The Northern states weren't really wild about even doing it. Finally, John Quincy Adams stood, came in, he was a Congressman at the time and, uh, and made it happen. And they, uh, the Smithsonian was established and, and set in, and this bequeath was put there. And the Smithsonian has been there ever since, since the mid 19th century, it's there today. Uh, the, one of the provisions that was made very clear by, by uh, the original uh, creation of the Smithsonian was that every single thing there would be available to the public for free. Forever. Forever. The yeah. museums are available for free. The libraries are available for free. You can use the Smithsonian Library. Absolutely. It's available to anyone. They have an entire online library that's available with all kinds of resources. When I was there, we were beginning the digital process and it's still ongoing now. So the libraries are there and the Smithsonian's always there available to everyone to use and to appreciate. And I was very fortunate that I got to use it and, and create this novel from it. It was a lot of fun, but the real thing about it, I digress. Okay, I know. you digress. I I'm digress. like, what about I the tomb? The tomb. <laughs> when you go to the Smithsonian Castle and you come in the, off the National Mall entrance to the left is James Smithson's tomb. And it was brought here from Genoa, Italy because uh, the, they were uh, where it was, where he was located. They were eliminating that cemetery and moving every grave out of there. And uh, they eventually, uh, Alexander Graham Bell stepped in and said, we need to go get, he was on the Smithsonian Library Board at the time, not Library Board, that's not right, Smithsonian, he was a, he was uh, a trustee, a trustee right. of, of the main 
uh, board that operates the Smithsonian. And they went over and they got Smithson's tomb and his body and they brought him back. And it's there, in there. But there's something really interesting about the tomb that was fascinating to me that I didn't know that's all in the novel. Mm -hmm. I incorporated all of that into the story. It was fascinating. What you'll read about in there is all true. And uh, that, that tomb and that body and that coffin had an had a interesting journey. And a long history. Had a lot to yeah. it, and I couldn't resist. It would seem to be the perfect thing that I needed to use in the novel. So that's all incorporated into the And if the book you watch too. the C-SPAN video, the, Steve shows the tomb, and he, he kind of shows you some of the- Yeah, you'll the, get to see all that secret. in the video. Yeah. I'll yeah. show you what it's I was talking really about. It's really interesting. It doesn't give away anything in the novel, but you know, I don't want to say too much because it's, it's interesting. Those of you who have not read it, you might you, know, you want to be surprised a little bit. But it was fascinating. I learned a lot about- uh, James Smithson. Uh, here's an interesting thing. Little, I digress a moment. Okay. The castle suffered a horrific fire in the uh, 1860s, and it's in the novel. It's incorporated in the novel, and the the castle was a lot of it was greatly destroyed. All of Smithson's personal belongings were pretty much destroyed in that fire, other than a few minor things and some of his books. His books still exist. They're over in a, a refrigerated vault. Uh, in the American History Museum, I believe is where they are in that, in that refrigerated vault. And that whole fire fascinated me. Now, there's nothing mysterious about it. You might say what happened you know, at, a, at a time of the Civil War and everything. It was just an accident. It was an accidental fire, but it caused tremendous damage and we lost a lot there. A lot of stuff, a lot of art was lost. A lot of Smithson's correspondence, his letters, his personal things, all gone. Mm -hmm. But his tomb note, his grave, no, but there's some interesting things that came out of that fire that I incorporated into the book as well. Yeah, so I think that's kind of the background and some of the secrets we wanted to give, but we can de we're definitely going to take questions now. So hopefully, let's take some questions, see what you want to yeah. do. Uh, hopefully, y'all shared some questions with, with Gabby. Gabby, we what, have you, some? what you got? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we have some great questions. Um, and I also um, just want to say that was that was fantastic. Thank you both. Um, you know, I always learn something new every time I, I hear you guys talk about these things. Um, and there were also uh, a lot of complimentary comments about your library uh, behind you there. <laughs> just a little thing you can see over here. All of these are- I wanna see if I can turn them. Just a little bit. Yeah. All of these are what are travel guides. I buy them from the 19th and early 20th century. You know how people used to travel to Europe and they'd go places, they'd come back and they'd write about their experience. Well, I buy those and I keep them here because things in Europe never change. It, the descriptions pretty much kind of stay the same. Stuff. So I have probably, I don't know, two, 300 of those right there. Uh, over there in that far corner, way over there in the corner, those three shelves are the books I'm using to write the novel I'm working on right now. And I kind of change them in and out because I don't have a lot of room. Right, so let's show them really quick. Sorry, Gabby, but I think if no, they look at it, I'll tilt it this yeah. way. Over here is, is more interesting. This right here, uh, when I go to castles and I go to places in Europe and I go, I always buy all the little travel books, you know, the little travel guides, the little tourist books that they sell relative to those locations. And that's what those are. There's, God, there must be a couple thousand in there. And they're all there. And then the rest are my fiction books that I kind of. Uh, and you have to favorites. point out Jim is up there. So Jim James Rollins, Rollins you, a lot of you know he's one of Steve's best friends. So he's have, up there. I have that up there. And then my Michener collection down at the far end. I have a complete collection and you got of Michener. Cussler and, and I have a, I have a Cussler and collection and Ludlum, Ludlum and, and uh, there's a few people that I collected a complete of. But yeah, and show them those, the little red ones right there. Which one? The, oh, yeah. These. What are those? Yeah, these are really cool. These are uh, uh, 19th century Bodeckers. These were the the, the travel channel of the 19th century, this was it. And when you went somewhere like Southern France right here, you'd always get your Bodecker yeah, to take with you. On. I just want to show you, like, look how cool this is. Can you see that? Wow. Maps and everything. Yeah, it's so, it, it, and they're very fragile. So I'm, you know, but there's, look, like the These map. Wonderful. You can unfold. Oh, wow. It's just so beautiful. And I use it occasionally because none of the descriptions in here change. Uh, of the historic stays, places. Stays there. Yeah. Stays the same. Yeah. And what you guys can't see is all those um, cabinets underneath the shelves are also full of books. Yeah. They're full of, they're full like, of more modern travel guides. Yeah. Like, am I still in the frame? But like 
all there's travel guides and travel guides and travel guides. I, I don't I don't use the internet for those kinds of things. I like actual maps and I like actual. Well, yeah, and way over there, baby, show them the the globe. Sorry, Gabby, we just hijacked. No, yeah. this is this is yeah. actually yeah, great. Globe, way over there in the corner. Yeah, can you go? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I'm Boston. Because it's really neat. So this he yeah. set up with all the big maps. So we kill spread them out on his desk, and then he. Well, we're we're seeing the, the it's behind the lamp. Yeah, and the lamps are the lamp. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. This uh, this is actually one of those bars, you know, that has a bar in it. I took the bar out and I just put my maps in there. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I I need one of those. <laughs> Well, I, I like to use actual maps. I don't like to use uh, internet maps or things like that. I like Michelin maps are really good, particularly mm -hmm. very good. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Question. We digress. Yeah. We, we digress we're we're digressing. Yeah. That was fantastic. And actually, one of the first questions was asking for a tour of the room that you're in. So oh. we covered that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is my new office where I, where I work. Uh, we just moved here uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we showed you most everything like on his desk is all his can you see that all his paperweights when i go to a place i like to buy these little paperweights and this one has charlemagne in the middle of it yeah and then uh, like uh this one is uh from malta yeah and i just i buy them and i put them up here because as i'm oh, working this one is there's great. from ludwig in yeah. germany Sandy Schweinstein. Beautiful. And, yeah. and they remind me of where i was where i went oh, and there's the smithsonite yeah this is the smithsonite that uh, I bought at an auction at a Smithsonian Libraries event uh, years ago. Uh, this is the, the mineral, it's a zinc compound that's named for James Smithson. And so it's Smithsonite. It doesn't have a whole lot of uses in the world. Uh, it has a little bit of uses in electronics, but not much. But I bought this piece uh, a long time ago and I keep it on the desk here. Yeah, we digress a lot. Okay. No, that was, that was incredible, that's, thank you. Pretty much, yeah, that's, that's pretty much yeah, it. That's pretty much all. Just underneath where the, the laptop is right now, this is more a lot idea of like books. dictionaries and thesaurus and idea books. Idea and books, mainly books I've I'm come curious, across. Why do you have binoculars? Uh, I used to watch, like I, on the I used to watch the yeah. golfers, but there's no golfers to watch anymore. Yeah. yeah, and then this okay, one more digress. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Show, this is the best thing in the whole office. So, this is Steve's toy box. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Right, so when- See he, these guys right here, these are really fun. Yeah. Cause you, you do this around, see the chickens? <laughs> and the trick is to try to get the chickens to all put their head up. And I bought this in Spain and it's really quite therapeutic. So when he gets stuck with his ideas- It cleans your head yeah, up. Yeah, sometimes he comes and bothers me, but- <laughs> This one, this, this is simple. I don't yeah. like battery powered stuff. Where's the- Jacob's ladder. Yeah, that's, right. a, that's a fun one. Yeah, when I met Steve, he was still practicing law. And he didn't have any of this. And when he would get stuck, it was so, so sad. He would take a tape measure, just like a little realtor tape measure, and he would pull it out one inch and he would just flick it, like going, going, going. It's just a way to clean your head out. And that was all, that was the only thing yeah. he had to, to clean it, like to play with. So I was like, all right, we got to get some. So I got some toys and stuff. I play with I play <laughs> toy, with box. toy yeah. box. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. For real, we're going to do it. Now there's two questions. We're digressing again. Here we go. That was fantastic. Thank you. So here's a more serious question. Um, so WorldCat lists more than 7,000 publications about the Smithsonian. So what research did you do and which publications were the most useful for your knowledge of the Smithsonian? I really did all of mine by talking to people up there, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I, there's a Smithson biography that's written by a, a, a lady who worked at Smithsonian and I, I forgot her name now, to be honest with you. It's a- it's, Heather Ewing, perhaps? Yes, the, it's regarded as the definitive book on mm -hmm. James Smithson. And so I did use that for him. Uh, but as far as that, what I would do is, uh, uh, some of the Smithsonian Library people were very like helpful. Mary Augusta. Mary Augusta was very yeah. helpful. Martin, Martin was very, was so very helpful. helpful. Yeah. And they got me information that I needed. Uh, mm -hmm. Rick Stam was great. I needed yeah. some, uh, I wanted to know who was on the, uh, who was a uh, Smithsonian uh, trustee back in the early in the in the 1830s and 40s and Rick was able to get that information uh, from the archives up there so I basically did most of my it's one of the rare books because I normally don't do firsthand uh, stuff like that I normally use books when I do the research mm -hmm. I use around 400 books but this one I had the resources right there so I took advantage of it yeah 
Yeah, that's great. Um, so another question here. I know you travel quite extensively to conduct research for your novels. So how did the research for this novel compare to, to those? Well, it was mainly to DC. We did, yeah. we did probably five or six yeah. journeys yeah. up there uh, dealing with that. The rest of the novel takes place in Arkansas, which we went to. Right. So I was there and there. But then a whole bunch of it takes place in New Mexico. Now we went to New Mexico, but I didn't go as far north as in the novel. So I, I, I talked to people who had been there and they told me about we it. We had and friends that lived friends there. Friends that lived there. Yeah. And I did there I did do research on the on the northeastern part of New Mexico, up there be above Santa Fe. Uh, up, up in that in that area and it's probably one of the most heavily researched on-site books you've ever yeah, written yeah I don't do yeah because normally I on a research trip for a book we go to the place but we'll go for like a week and we have to you know we're working 12 to 14 hours a day because we only have so much time in those cities and I ask some questions yeah. but I mainly buy materials and right. bring them back that stuff I showed you back here yeah. on the show like we'll fill a whole suitcase with, with just stuff, the books stuff, yeah. yeah because we don't have there's no time you know he does as much as he can and we'll get experts but it was the, the beauty of this book is e everything was at our, our fingers we had everybody yeah. right there so i just yeah. asked them and i was able to get firsthand and and you believe me there are no books that can provide you the kind of information like they did now and by the way there's nothing magical about me getting that that's available to anybody right anybody can can go see those folks and anybody can go talk to them right yeah Yep, we are we are definitely open to the public. So right. if anyone wants to, um, you know, come and ask us questions, we're happy to we're happy to answer them. Definitely. So you mentioned um, you mentioned the New Mexico aspect, uh, and there was a specific question about that. Um, you know, asking if that part of the book was researched and based on historical events. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was, a lot of it was based on on things that are speculated about the uh, the uh, the Knights of the Golden Circle and their connection to that area. I incorporated something in the novel called the Peralta Stones. They were found actually in Arizona. The Peralta Stones. No one knows what they mean. No one knows where they point. No one knows anything about them, and that's perfect for me because no one knows anything but, and, but the uh, behind the scenes is steve found these stones he's like i'm using the stones these are the stones and there there's replicas of them yeah. located the originals are gone right there's a replicas located in phoenix right and i went and saw the orig the replicas that were there but, but i incorporated but like he so we printed off you remember we printed off pictures of each one and you agonized over what these stones could mean yeah i had to figure oh my gosh. i had to interpret i had to create an interpretation of the stones that worked with the stone so it was like what should this mean and we there was like a horse or something and we tried 10 different things for that horse but we finally, we figured finally it, did it finally figured it out it was like what if it what if it's a line that you draw this way does that mean anything no what if you go this way what if there's a clue that says about this that's going to go to the, that was a tough that it was, was tough. that was tough the peralta stones are interesting they're in the novel yeah. uh we had to redraw them uh you know minotaur redrew them their, their artists drew them our own representations of them and but i they're actual i didn't change a thing on the stones i just created my own interpretation of them and by the way there is no other interpretation no one knows what they mean Right. KJ Birch is on here. Just a real shout out to KJ. Hey, hello, KJ. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. A friend we haven't talked to in a long time. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Aggressive. That's great. I'm sorry. Stay focused. I'm focused. 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 <laughs> yeah. Working a long time. Focus. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Any any social interaction is great. <laughs> um, so another another great question here from from Liz O'Brien, who you both know. Oh, hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. <laughs> so is there anything you had to edit out of the Lost Order? You know, with so much research and history that you uncovered, and how do you decide, you know, what to include in your novels, and how is the editing process handled? Well, the, re the research process, as I said, is about four hundred sources. 400 books that I use. And I know this was no exception. I did have a lot of books here because I had to deal, I had to learn a lot about a lot of different things. There's a lot of constant, there's a constitutional element to this novel that we haven't talked about. Right. That's the so what of the novel. And it's a fascinating constitutional theory that has fascinated me since law school. And the reader's going to learn something about the Constitution that I don't think you really knew. And it's all true and accurate in there. There's also a fascinating question about Congress 
in here as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing about Congress, and we actually went, um, Christine, oh, yeah, you know, Christine took me from the libraries, who worked at the libraries. She took me over to, to meet the parliamentarian of the United States House. And he and I had a conversation about this particular quirk in the Constitution that involves the Senate rules. And I'm not going to say what it is. I don't want to give it away to anyone who hasn't read the book. But I explained to him what I had. It wasn't mine, by the way. I got it from a book. Uh, that a guy wrote a political book about it and postulated this idea. And it's referenced in the writer's note too, by the way, that book, if you want to read it. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I postulated that theory to the parliamentarian. He says, no, it could actually happen. This could actually This be theory done. is so cool because yeah. Steve was talking to the parliamentarian and saying, can this happen? And the actual real life parliamentarian said, no, yeah, we, yes, sir. If they voted, if they voted if they to voted, do it, if it they happen. voted to do it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating because it would change everything. Right. It would change yeah, the entire really cool. government of the United States. If you made this one little change, right. Parliamentarian change right. that is perfectly legal under the constitution. Right. So it's all in there. So I had to learn about all that. I had to yeah. read about it. The book deals with the United States Senate is a very in a very great detail and I had learned a lot about the Senate that I did not know and I think our readers will be fascinated to learn some things about the Senate that yeah. they didn't know. But back to Liz's question just really quick not necessarily in this book and but in some other books there have been a lot of times when the history is of something maybe not directly related to the plot but but a, a neighbor to the plot is so fascinating and Steve will put it in the book and we realize can't do it. We can't. can't so he it. ends up deleting it out. When I'm done, I yeah. have notes about this tall. They're about they're about six eight yeah. inches tall of notes. I'm only going to use ten percent of that. Yeah. Ninety percent of it's going to get chunked. Yeah. And so sometimes I put it in there, and it sounds really cool. Yeah. But as I reread and go through the novels, I realize it can't be there. So I'm mainly cutting. Yeah. So I'm using, so I'm cutting far more than I'm including yeah. almost all the time. That's the trick in my genre is mixing information with action. Yeah. Very, very, very yeah. tough. So when yeah. he's got that main plot line going, if we want to be right here, circling that main plot line constantly, and if, if the story or if the subplot or if the piece of history is kind of down here, up here, it's got to go. It's got to go. And, yeah. and that comes a lot from my reading it. And then when Elizabeth reads it, she's the first one to read the novel. And so she'll go through it and say, well, it's a little draggy right here. I mean, it's a little too much. And you, you, I, I do mean, I really like, need to that's know? That's really interesting. I don't really I'm need to know I'm not quite that. sure why it's here. You know, so she's she's so <laughs> kind and gentle with me. I, just I am say, nice. Yeah. No, you're not. No. <laughs> I just want it to be the best it can be. No, you know. Uh, you're, 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 but, <laughs> okay, let's next get to question, the next question. Next question. <laughs> sure, sure. So this sort of builds on, on that question. Um, so hearing you talk about the years long process for getting the lost order to print, um, but you know, you also release a book a year. So how many books are you working on at any given time in order to do that? At, at all times, there's three in my head, always. Sometimes there's four. For a short period of time, there's four. Like recently, I just finished the final edits of next year's book, the final, the last thing. So there was four in mind because I was writing 2000, uh, the, 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 the one after that, 2022 novel, I'm writing that right. and I'm plotting and conceiving 2023 and I'm thinking about 24. Yeah. So there's, there's three going and then the, for a short period of time, there's four. And I just learned to compartmentalize those because mm -hmm. the moment I'm done writing, the book and I turn it in, I start the next one yeah. almost the next day. That's like this. You know, uh, like this whole box. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here she goes. Oh, it's really heavy. Oh my See gosh. This whole box and all these papers, oh all the stacks, each clip together thing is a different novel. Oh my gosh. You know, or a different <laughs> line or different Yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty constant. much old school. I still use paper. And so uh, I just kind of keep it together. <laughs> Because like I said, I'm writing 22 right now. I'm actively researching and outlining 23 and I'm conceptualizing 24. The good thing is I got these ideas a few years ago. So they're not, I'm not having to come fresh, you know, right off my head with them. But, uh, you know, I still then I'll have soon when I turn in 22, uh, I'll have to start thinking about 25 right. down the road, you know, right. what that would be. But it, I, I have to stay that far ahead because of the research. It takes me six months of preliminary research before I write. And then 12 months to write it and 
additional 12 months of research during that time too. So it's an 18 month process to create a novel. Not even including the, the inception of the idea and the initial, no, yeah. yeah. Yeah, once I say, this is what I'm gonna write, yeah. it's 18 months is what it is. Wow, yeah. amazing. It's crazy. It's incredible. Like the other night we were just kind of sitting talking about the book he's writing right now and we were talking about character development and what are the qualities of this character and what's what's You're being so kind right now the other night you weren't quite that kind when you said my I'm character fine. really is boring <laughs> i just said i wanted to flesh it out a little bit no you, you used the word boring i recall I mean, you and, know and and, and character development is really important it's like he's dead i believe was the I don't quote think I said yeah, that. yeah you did you but well now he has a whole family he has a backstory i know about his mama i know about his daddy well the great part is i just tell her okay what do you want to do and so yeah. she just starts talking yeah and she yeah. comes up her 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 imagination bank is full up here it's <laughs> all full and we need to get it out right. mine is kind of uh, uh depleting you know and because after 20 novels you know you begin to so you need a fresh look at it and and what she said she was unfortunately she was exactly correct yeah so that that leads into another great question here which is what is liz's role in steve's writing process well, she has a very specialized role and and usually here's the way it works. Elizabeth knows I'm writing a novel. She knows like this one. She knew I'm writing a novel about Smithsonian and it's going to have something to do with the Constitution and it's Smithsonian. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't tell her anything else. Right. I don't tell her anything about on purpose. It. On purpose. Yeah. I don't tell her what I'm doing. Right. Every once in a while, like the other night, I asked her because I was a little stuck with this character. What would you do to this particular character? But I still don't tell her the plot. Right. I still don't tell her what story is about. I don't tell her anything about the story. Right. That's done on purpose. Yeah. Because when I'm done and I've read it about 60 times, I go, I read my novels about 60 times. When I'm done going through it and I've done all I can do, I give it to her. Mm -hmm. And she's the first human being to read it and to know, to even see it. And so that way her eyes are fresh. And she goes through it and I'll give you, you know, these track changes. I hate track changes with a passion. Did you know you could stack track changes? You can have like 10 stacked on top of one another. I've learned that now with her uh, because there are, there are just gazillion track changes. There's not that many. There's a gazillion track changes. Yeah. And, and they're, they're needed. I'm not, I'd say I use about 90% of them. There may be a little bit every once in a while I say, no, I'm staying with what I got there. But I do 90% of what she says because she's got, I got to trust her fresh eye. Right. There's no point in having the fresh eye if you're not going to listen to it. Yeah. So here's the thing, though. If she finds something in that process, like where I've screwed up the plot, like the guy was dead here and now he's alive <laughs> and he's dead again because when I was editing, I forgot or something. Or like motivation. Something. Motivation. I usually don't do yeah. that, but, yeah. but but I will make occasionally a plot flaw. Yeah, I'll leave. I just, it just blows right by me. Yeah. And if she finds that, she gets purses and shoes. That's her reward, purses and shoes. All the ladies. And they're <laughs> yes. not from Target, which is a lovely place. <laughs> They're from that, you know, yeah. Louis Vuitton or Channel Store Channel. and Prada. Channel Store. And, you know, she gets she gets a rather expensive purse or a shoe, and the reason why that's there is it gives me incentive not to screw up. Now, all the ladies are like, "Yes." There were like three books in a row. She got nothing. The yeah. last book, she got one. Yeah, she got one. She found uh, she found something, and to be honest with you, it was my fault because I actually knew it was there, mm -hmm. and I didn't get it out before I gave it to her, and, and and it was almost like a test. I wanted to see if she'd find it, and sure enough, she was right on it. Man. Of course, she got, of course, she got it, and so I said, "Okay, fine, you win, yeah. you win." Well, in my in my other life, I I own a publishing company with my two partners, and I edit uh, books all the time. But what I have to say is, this is our livelihood. You know, this is what we do for a living. Jillian, one of my partners is on here. There right she is, right Jillian there. Jillian Stein, hi. And, Facebook ladies yeah, there. And uh, MJ Rose is my other partner, but this is our livelihood. This is, this is how we, you know, this is our job. And so when I'm reading his manuscripts, it, the most important thing is that I'm looking for anything that one of you would pick out and say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Or that doesn't, I mean, we want it to be right. The we motivations guys, have to be right. Yeah. Everything has to be correct. Yeah, we, we want you guys to get these novels and say, okay. I mean, yeah. there's, a, there's an element of belief suspension sure. in any thriller. Of course. And, but you can't go to the point to where it's like, 
that's absurd. Right. You know, there's got to be proper foreshadowing. There's got to be A to B to C to, you know, you've got to lead the reader on this path and then you have to give them the path. really hard at that. But after 60 reads and 18 months, you get a little close to it. So you need a fresh, so she's the fresh eye. And then the next people to read it are my agent and my editor at that point. But after she's read it, I make her corrections before I give it to them. Right. Yeah. So that's how we do that. And then on research trips, I'm the camera lady and I have the backpack and I, you know, hold the stuff because when he's researching, he's kind of all over the place. Um, We were in Portugal for the Alexandria Lane and we're in Belen and we're, we're touring this abbey and so cool. And Steve's like, I need you to take pictures of all the hinges. Just get those hinges, take the hinge. And I was like, okay. So, and this is back before smartphones. So, you know, I'm with my camera. I like, cameras in. Yeah. And <laughs> the reason is because he was going to have a chase scene and he needed to know which way the doors were going to open. And what they look like. And, and what they look like. And how they and, because he wanted it to be so real so that if some of you at mm-hmm. some point either live there or go there and you're like, okay, I can envision the bad guy running through here and caught and chasing him. So, and yeah. I added a door at a place right. and I put it in the writer's note that I added a door. It's very important. My readers really want me to be right on. Right. And, you know, and so I have to be as close as I can. I make mistakes like everyone else, though. We always, there's always one a book. At least. At least one yeah. book that I that I mess up. We fix no, it. No, Steve, you don't make any mistakes. Oh, I do. <laughs> I, every once in a while, I mean, every book is one. I always wonder what's it going to be in each book. Right. It kind of comes right. out of nowhere. Uh, we fix them all in the mass market edition, so they all get corrected. But, and I don't mind. Please point them out. I want to get it right. I really do. What I take issue with is people who chew me out about something in which they really don't know the answer, and they just kind of tell yeah, me. That's okay. We're going to digress on that. Okay. okay. Next yeah. question. <laughs> so, um, someone actually, I think, is talking about the um, maybe about those those notes saying uh, that they really enjoyed the book in the audio version and they love your comments in between the chapters too. So I think in the audio version are those notes in between chapters? Yeah, that's, that... the, that's called the writer's cut. It was created oh, okay. uh, and uh, with the Patriot thread in 2014. We did it in 14, 16, 17. There's one for Lost yeah. Order. We did it in 18 mm-hmm. and we did it in 19 and we did it this year, 20. Uh, so they're the writer's cut. And what I do is I just come on at the end of each chapter and give you a little 15 second piece of information about something in that chapter that you never knew and you never are going to know unless I tell you. And if you don't want to hear my comments, you can fast forward through them. And we actually give you two versions when you download it, one with comments, one without. So you can pick if you don't like it, but most people have enjoyed it. We did not do one for next year's book, uh, The Kaiser's Web. We did not do one for that. With COVID. It, With it, COVID, it didn't work yeah. out where we could do it. <laughs> but what it is, yes, a lot of that comes from the notes. It's stuff that didn't make it into the books, but it's stuff that, um, like in this book, there's one where it talks about the, the, the character Martin Thomas, which I named after Martin, who works for the library's first name, and Mary Augustus Thomas, who worked for the library, her last name, and I put it right. together. And, you know, and I just note that in there that where that name came from. Love it. That's awesome. Um, so there were also a few questions about uh, movies and whether or not either this book or another Cotton Malone book might be made into a movie. A lot of talk. We uh, hope so. A lot of talk. Uh, we, it is optioned to a producer. Uh, haven't seen any checks, though. No, <laughs> checks, uh, no one's come with a check and said, I want to buy it. We're ready to go. Let's make it. Uh, maybe one day it would be cool. It, it, it always discourages me a little bit because, uh, you know, on all the streaming networks, if you go to all the streaming platforms, pick anyone, I don't care. There's nothing like what I write on any of them. It, you would think there's room for one. Yeah. Just yeah. one. Just Definitely. one up there. Because, Not yeah, just for <laughs> Not one. The it would make a great streaming video. And and who which actor would you pick to play Cotton Malone? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I whoever would, wants whoever to play. Whoever wants to do it. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I would be a great writer for producer to work with because I'm not going to tell him what to do. And uh, I'm not going to, you know, you're not messing with my vision. You know, he has his vision and, and put it together. They asked me when they bought the rights, they asked me one thing. They said, What tell us? Is there anything that you would want us to know? And I said, well, okay, since you asked, I'll tell you the one thing that would bother me. 
you bought the books because you wanted my audience. And that's why they buy your stuff, by the way. They don't really need my books because they can create their own treasure hunter, work for the government. They don't, they can get a script and write their own. They buy our books, just like they bought Jack Reacher, just like they bought a Custler book. They want your audience to come with the book. And I said, well, if you're going to buy the books to, to bring my audience, please just don't fake it. You know, with the places. you know, with the places. with the places, my books, the places, as I told you, are part of the novel. Right. There are characters in the novel. You can't pretend that we're in Paris when we're really not. You can't pretend we're in New Mexico, you know, unless you find a place that looks exactly like it to make it work. You've got to be true to that because the readers, my readers will just go, ah, oh, come on. So yeah. I, that's all I would ask you to do is, don't fake it when it comes to where you want to put it. And that's going to be the problem with my novels because you've got to go to those places and that would be expensive. Yeah. Right now it's almost prohibitive. You can't even, right. you couldn't even go. You, if, it, if they film one now, it'd be an American book. It would have to it'd be, be one of the yeah. American books. Is yeah. what it so would. The Lost, Lost Order. Order. Oh, there you go. That would make a terrific, terrific yeah. it would. streaming it series. Would with all the cool stuff in there and the, mm -hmm. the Knights of the Golden Circle and all that stuff, it'd be just great. But again- And the castle, the castle oh, is yeah. so cool. It's just yeah. a lot of lot of talk and discussion, yeah. but nothing firm, firm yet. <laughs> Maybe one day, Maybe. Uh, my fingers are crossed. <laughs> so another question. So given the vastness of the Smithsonian, do you envision Cotton ever returning for another story? Yes, I do, I actually do. and. Uh, I, I want to do one with him. If not him, then Luke Daniels, who's a, a secondary character, not in this book, but in the other books. We're starting a new series with Luke that'll start publishing in 23. Uh, we're going to have, he's going to have his own series. He would be wonderful to have a Smithsonian yeah. adventure with, absolutely. And he may very well have one. Yeah. I have something that Martin gave me. He gave me one, a, a photostat, a copy of one of James Smithson's books. And there was something very interesting in one of those books. And I've held on to that all these years. And it may very well work itself into a Luke Daniels book. But right now, Cotton Malone is staying overseas. And he's going to stay overseas for the next few years. Uh, I did five American books, and I've sent him back overseas a couple of books ago. And now he'll stay there for a while. But Luke Daniels could definitely yeah. come into the Smithsonian. Because Luke actually works for the Magellan Billet. So he's based out of the US. He can go anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, so it would be a great character. May very well yeah. be a Luke Daniels book in yeah. 20, 24, 25 yeah. with the Smithsonian back in it again. Yes. Yeah. That's exciting. I'm I'm thrilled to hear that. <laughs> um, so I we still have a lot of questions. Okay. Um, but we're coming up on, on six. Do you two have a, a, a little more time to share Absolutely. with us? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, then we'll do a few more before we wrap up. And we should say, I I see all so many of our friends popping up and saying hi. So Fedora and Charity and so many of you, I'm like trying to see it and then I can't see it so well. But we thank you guys for being here. Our, our friends that have, you know, heard Steve speak before. We really appreciate it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. No questions, let's do them. Okay, great. So this is a fun one. Um, would you ever want to be part of a secret society? And if yes, which one? I'm not much of a joiner, so <laughs> <laughs> really not. I don't, what am I joining? I don't join anything. So a secret. I'm trying to think of all the ones you've written. I've written a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of them. I know. I, I don't know if I want to be a, in one. What about the Cincinnati? Cincinnati was really that cool. Was really that was cool. in the 14th colony, the Society of Cincinnati. Yeah. We went to their national headquarters yeah, up in DC, cool. which is over off DuPont Circle where the mm -hmm. uh, where the embassies are. There's a there's a mansion over there. It's wonderful, yeah. it's amazing. That's all in the 14th colony. I don't know if I want to be a part of one, but I like I like You like interviewing. I like them. talking about yeah. them and studying them and learning all that. The Knights of Malta were really cool. Yeah, that were that I just uh, did the, the well because we went. This is hi Naomi. We went to um, Malta, Malta, and my son at the time was about ten, so this was about ten years ago. And you know we were we I mean our, our daughter went as well, but he was so excited because we're like you're going to meet the knight, like the head knight of the Knights of Malta. So for a little boy, this is like everything. And we said 
you, yes, sir, no, sir. You look him in the eye, you shake his hand, you use your manners. I mean, we are prepping him. We are like, this is the night. This is a special meeting. We're going to his castle, the whole thing. So sure enough, we go to the castle and we're heading up to the top. And here comes this man walking towards us in, you know, a polo shirt and cargo shorts. And flip-flops. And flip-flops. <laughs> That's the night. Because it's very hot in It's really hot. It's and, very and hot. My son said, he was like, um, sir, where's your, you know. Your armor. Your armor. <laughs> and he was the nicest man. He oh said, you know what? I keep it. I keep it up in the castle. So we went into one of the turrets. It was actually a museum. And he showed Eli, you know, the armor. And he let him try on the chain mail. And so he kind oh of played along with I learned, it. I learned, yeah. Nacho learned Malto, so much. Nacho Malto was really cool. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of them, but I don't know if I want to be a part of them. I like so many of them. I like yeah. to move around. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so another question that keeps coming up is, um, you know, how has the pandemic affected your research, your plans, all, all well, of that? Well, travel. I mean, we were supposed right. to be in Romania in May because I want to do a Romanian book and that's going to get pushed back a little bit. Uh, we, 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 I toured in February before it happened, before, before it was really going on. We toured uh, and then we haven't traveled any since yeah. and we've canceled all the trips for this year and next year. Yeah, so we we're, canceled about 19 or 20 So trips. we're not going anywhere uh, before 22. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. but we, but I have, a, I have a, a book event in Boston in November of 21. We'd probably be okay by then maybe, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> How it plays out, yeah. but uh, we're not going anywhere. It is a little bit. It it's been a little nice not to travel all over the world, but it's also been a little. We miss it. Right. We but you were it. also really lucky because we had done some trips for pleasure, just for fun trips. And Steve always is, even though they're they're fun, pleasurable trips. His brain is always working, and he was able to get a lot of research. He got ahead material. of myself. He kind of got ahead of himself, and so even though they were fun, he's got a huge stack of, of books and um, notes from places that we had been. 22 and 23 this, where yeah. I'm okay. 24, yeah. I'm going to do the Romanian so you book. Just switched your, yeah. He just switched everything around. We may go to Romania uh, in like May or June of 22. Yeah. And uh, we're going to do a Steve Berry and fans trip also to Poland in 22. Right. We were doing it in 21, but we've moved it to 22 now. Yeah. We're going to go see all the stuff from the Warsaw Protocol. Anybody can go. Yeah, anybody wants to go, <laughs> you can go online and uh, find out about it and come with us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I know those trips. I have not been lucky enough to be on one yet, but I know they're, I, I hear they're pretty awesome. So. We have a good time. And some of the ducks, they're called ducks uh, who go on the trips. That's their label. I see hi, some of the ducks are, are on and here. Hi, Jerry. On here. And, uh, and we have a good time with it. And we, we uh, what I do is I take a group about uh, 30 people and we go to the place where the novel is and I go through it and show you how I put it together. We go see all of the spots, all of the places, all of that stuff. If you wanna go with us, you go to my website, steveberry.org, go to the events page, there's a link. You can come with us in 22 and uh, you can become a duck. Yeah, I and if you, if you don't go on those trips, a lot of times when we travel, we'll do um, Facebook videos or Facebook lives and we put them on Steve's Facebook page. So you can look at, there's a ton of videos over there from back, way back when we were doing it with a video camera yeah, in Copenhagen, days. like back in the day. So his Facebook page, just the video tab is a really great kind of group of, of videos for if you like that kind of thing. Awesome. So um, there are also a couple questions about you know, what's next for Cotton Malone and um, someone asking if you can give us a bit of a teaser uh, about the Kaiser's Web. Kaiser's Web is a fascinating story that deals with something from World War II that surprised me that I, I didn't really know. And I think the reader's gonna go like, wow, I didn't know that either. I've wanted to do a book for a long time with World War II, with the Nazis, with Hitler, but what do you do? I mean, it's 85 years ago, you know, what do you and do? It's been done. What do you just yeah. been done to death? Right. But there's one thing that hasn't been done and they haven't dealt with it. And it's interesting and it's true. And I was able to weave that story together. And I was also able to get cotton to South America, which I've been wanting to do for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you're going to learn a lot about some things that I think you'd be surprised. You're going to go like, wow, I, I had no idea that was that was the case. And it's an interesting story. It also deals with a national election in Germany 
and something very interesting with the national elections in Germany. So cotton's going to get caught up in some great intrigue uh, in the Kaiser's web. And I'm writing the 2022 novel now, which will be a standalone. It's going to be a new character I've created. A brand new character that is really has depth and, and character because of her. <laughs> thanks to her, he was dead the other night. Remember, he was terrible the other night. But but Liz revived him. He revived now, and uh, he's an interesting guy. And uh, it's still action, history, secrets, conspiracies, all kind of thing. But a, a new character that I've been wanting to create. And then Cotton will be back in twenty three and twenty four. He'll be back there. Great. So. A wonderful question from a friend of yours, Susan Batley. Oh, um, yeah. oh. <laughs> so, yes. so what started your passion in history and integrating this passion into your novels? So folks will know who this is. Uh, Susan served on the Smithsonian Library Boards with me and eventually became chairman of the Smithsonian Chairwoman. Library, chairwoman of the Library Board. Uh, so I served her for many years and, and uh, she's a great supporter of the libraries. Uh, your question is, I've always had an interest in history ever since I was a kid. It was something that always fascinated me. History was never boring to me. It was interesting and I liked it. And I always read histories uh, so that when I started writing, I followed a simple rule. Never, ever, ever write what you know. That is terrible advice. Write what you love. If what you love and what you know are the same thing, wonderful. But if they're not, pick the one you love. So I was a lawyer, so I knew the law and I could write about that, but I didn't love it. I loved action, history, secrets, conspiracies, and I was able to put that together. So all of my novels take something from history, something real that you don't know much about, but it still has relevance today. It has to have both. And not only must it exist and be real from the past, but it still must be relevant today. And that really goes back all the way to high school and early 20s reading history and appreciating it because history is nothing more than a story. That's all it is, it's a story. And the best history, the easiest to understand, the most fun is a story. And, and so I just take that in, 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 into that form and I've been fortunate that I've been able to incorporate that and make it work here. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so bringing it back to the Smithsonian a little bit, um, so this question, I think, um, I, I know what, what it's inspired by. The, the Smithsonian is going to be celebrating our 175th anniversary next year. So this question is, if you were to put together an exhibit to celebrate the Smithsonian's 175th anniversary, what would you highlight? Well, I'm fascinated by the Smithsonian Castle. I love that building. It's a shame that the, the incarnation you see now is not what it was. There used to be a giant auditorium on the second floor. There used to be exhibit rooms. There was a lot there. Changed dramatically after the fire in the 1860s. I would love to see the castle very much highlighted in that and that the people get to see what the castle was like and how it evolved and how it became the center of science and knowledge and information and education. It actually became something really magical. You understand when they created that in the 1830s, I mean, that was revolutionary what they were doing. It had never been done before. Right. No one had ever done anything like that right. before. And they were doing it in a highly volatile political atmosphere, but they did it and they made it work. And I'd love to see them focus on that. And the Smithsonian secretaries and the men who took control of it and steered it, that'd be fascinating to see. And I wish one day if they had like a gazillion dollars and they could do it, they could put the castle back like it was. It would be cool to see it like it was. It didn't work because of structural problems, but today we could fix all that. We can make all that work, but it'd be neat to put it back like it was. It would be amazing to see it uh, as it was. In the novel, I show you how it was, by the way, in The Lost Order. Yeah. There's a whole flashback scenes that take place back in its original heyday. Yeah. And, and speaking of that heyday, another question um, here about The Lost Order, uh, asks if the Megatherium Club is featured in the book at all. It's Megatherium Club. I don't know what that is. That's new. Oh, me. okay. Well, we'll have to 
I'll send you some links. Um, yeah, yeah, that's something new for me. Yeah, it was it was a group of young scientists who all lived in the Smithsonian Castle. I knew about oh, the knew about I knew about scientists. the scientists, but I didn't know they had a club. That's yes. A the club. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I read a lot about those young scientists and what they did up into the towers and they lived yeah. up in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I didn't know they had a name. That's cool. They did. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we'll have to send you some, send you some links. <laughs> Rick, Rick told us a lot about those and showed yeah. us a lot about when we were doing the tour there. Yeah, yeah. They're, the I agree with you. The, the history of the castle is just fascinating That's and um, and of the Smithsonian in general. So yeah, there's there's so much there. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. Yeah. Nothing like it. Nothing even approaching it anywhere in the world. It's very interesting too. A lot of people don't realize this, but the Smithsonian is exempt from a lot of political restrictions. Like when you can't make contact to certain countries and all, that, that, that we're not allowed. The Smithsonian can't. To share, they, they, to share knowledge yeah. and can do that. There are a lot of there are a lot of exempt yeah. because of their main their main job is to is the dissemination of knowledge. That's right. Cool. Yeah, cool job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I think I'll have this be our last question. There are some more, but I don't want to I don't want to keep people too long. Um, and this is a, a fun one to end on, which is uh, how did you two meet? Because you're a very <laughs> cute couple. <laughs> Oh, he's now going to be cheesy. Yeah. We, no. we were um, we were a blind date, actually. Uh, a really good friend of ours. We we had both been in other relationships, and you know, kind of were done with dating and all those things. And a good friend of ours tricked me um, into <laughs> she she said, "Come on, let's go some run some errands." You know, with your girlfriends, you run errands. And so we pulled up outside of Steve's law office. And I said, what are we doing here? And she said, I love you both. You're perfect for each other. You're just going to meet him right now. Yeah, but here's the thing. Now, tell them what you said about me. No, tell no, them what I, you I'm said. <laughs> tell them what you said about me. So we're all friends now. Okay. What'd you say? I, you just, you... <laughs> tell them what you said. <laughs> Steve's a little bit older than me. And I was like, I don't know if I. Would... Because he's. Because he's older. Old. I didn't say Not old. older. I said older. You said old. And because um, I she, uh, <laughs> she came in and we kind of hit it off for a few minutes there. Yeah. And I, I had to go to a dinner that night uh, on the Navy base yeah. where I was. And I said, you'd like to come to the dinner with me. And she said, well, I said no, because I had another blind date that another friend had set me up on. But I said, I'm free tomorrow night. And we went on a date the next night and I never dated anybody else after that. So and I cut it really short with that blind date that night. So, she did. She did. I did yeah. It was just something that, that <laughs> yeah, I say all the time. I can't believe you said that. We have a lot of uh, folks who are single and they're looking for spouses and looking for things. And I tell them all the time, you're never going, the one place you're never going to find one is when you go look. Right. If you go look, oh, yeah. you're never, it has to find you. Right. And, and actually, and, Naomi, who is on this chat right now, I remember calling her and saying, I met someone and I had been <laughs> single for a while. And she was like, seriously? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Yeah. And so, so it just, it just, yeah. it was just a Thursday afternoon that it just came out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> there it was. So, and never, then when we got, when we got married, um, Sherry was just saying, we had a big party. We got married in my daddy's house in the living room, just oh. with our close family. And then we just had a big party because we were so happy. Um, I don't know. We invited, we found each other. We invited, and so it's like, let's party. <laughs> we invited like 300, like 500 came. Yeah, everybody. Oh my gosh. Yes, I mean it was it was, a it was really, just a big party and it was fun. It was a really fun night. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and then we um we were just telling Gabby we went to we flew the next morning early. We got up at like five in the morning, flew to Greece, um to Athens, and we took a we took a cruise around the uh, the Black Sea, which eventually made its way into into Kashwichnava. Um, one of them. The cruise boat, the scenes from uh, the, the boat. Patriot threat. The Patriot threat. The yeah. Patriot threat all yeah. made its way into the Patriot threat. Yeah. Sure but did. that was that was a long time ago, and it's funny because um, I That's started. I was 15, 15 years. Fifteen years ago, and and so Templar Legacy. Steve had published a couple of books, and um, Templar Legacy was in its page proof form, and so he said, "Could you just read this and tell me if you find any mistakes or anything? You know, typo." Oh. So I read it, and I was like. I don't know if I should say this, you know, we're, we're kind of new, but he had a flashlight and now he doesn't have a flashlight or it was something like a, a gun. And he said, all right, you're going to start reading more books. But the funniest thing I'll tell this and then we'll, and then we'll stop and you're going to talk to the people. 
right after we met, I mean, he told me he was a writer. And I was like, oh gosh. But I, did, I, ne know. I never really advertised it. Uh, I, uh, the people in my town, never, never, I'd already published at that point four books. Three, three. Three books. Yeah. Nobody, nobody paid any attention. Nobody cared. It was a small town. You know, and, no, it's South Georgia. And, small and nor did I care. I just yeah. put them up on the shelf and it's great. Temple of Legacy changed everything for him. Right. But, but I just never really made a big deal of it. And I never even told her I wrote. Right. And I, like, I saw the books and I was like, okay, he's a writer. But I'm thinking, what if he sucks? Like, what if he's bad? <laughs> right? So, so she filched the book up. Right. So finally I was like, all right, I love him. It's okay. This was a few months later. So I, I took the Romanoff prophecy, a paperback. Uh, this is before e-readers. And I read it in secret because I thought, okay, it's okay. If he's bad, if he's a bad writer, I love this man. It's going to be okay. So I finished the Romanoff prophecy and I called him and I was like, oh, you're a good writer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and that book had been a New York Times bestseller, and like all this, he was like, "Thanks." She's always been quite <laughs> honest, <laughs> quite honest. So, uh, so that, that was a good question to end on. We were a blind date um, fifteen years, a little 15 over fifteen years ago, years ago and over, over fifteen years, ago. over fifteen, yeah, over almost sixteen 15 years. years. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, so yeah, I'm blushing now. So now tell, <laughs> her, tell your story. I, yeah, this has been great having us here because I haven't done much with the libraries in a while. Uh, it's been what three years, I think, since I uh, since my time with the board ended. I served six years on the board, so I haven't. I wanted I wanted to say to everyone, I appreciate you coming here tonight. I appreciate you giving us your time and hearing what we have to say and listening. I do want to say one thing to you though about uh, about libraries. Just one thing that's true. Remember, I told you that thing from the past that I always use. Here's one from the Alexandria link. In the Alexandria link, I deal with the Library of Alexandria, which was the greatest repository of knowledge in the ancient world. I mean, it was magnificent. It was the library. It was the place for knowledge. But unfortunately, that library vanished. Now, a lot of people say, what happened to it? Well, some say the Romans came and they destroyed it and burned it. Not true. Not true. They burned one of the off-site storage facilities, but they never touched the main building. Then some people say, well, the Christians, when they came and took over Egypt, they got rid of it because it was all pagan stuff in there. That's not true either. It never happened. Then they said, well, wait a minute. In the fourth century, when the Muslims took over and they came and took over and, and had it, they, um, they burned all of the, the papyri and the scrolls in their baths to, to heat their baths. Well, that sounds really neat. And I used it in the book even, but it's not true either. None of that is true. Here's what happened to the Library of Alexandria, the greatest repository of knowledge in the ancient world. It simply rotted away. That's what happened. It just rotted away. The Ptolemies, who were the, uh, the, the pharaohs of Egypt, lost power. They were the ones who supported the libraries financially and kept them going. They, that money was not there anymore, so the building deteriorated. The scrolls went away. The locals picked the building apart stone by stone to use it for other things. They picked it so clean down to the dirt that to this day, we have no idea where the actual building sat in Alexandria. That shows you what can happen to the greatest repository of knowledge in the ancient world simply by neglect. And I say that to you, just please keep in mind the Smithsonian libraries, because everyone thinks the government supports the libraries. They do. They pay about 80% of the Smithsonian library's budget, but there's 20% of that budget that has to be raised every year or else those doors can't be open. And that's what we did on the Smithsonian Libraries Board. We raise that money every year. So please keep it in mind. Please keep the libraries in mind. They need your help to keep going so it all be free. We got one thing for you to be really cool. Wait, there's two, there's a couple ways to do because adopt a book. Don't adopt worry. a book. I'm back. Two ways. You're right. Oh, <laughs> see, I have to have her. I First know, way. I was standing over there. I was like, a really cool a thing is adopt a book. Adopt a book program is really neat. You actually adopt a book. And it's very expensive. You can do it for $100, $200. Some of them are a little more. And that money actually pays for the restoration of a book. And it becomes your book. And you have a little plaque in the front. You can come visit your book. You can bring people to see your book. I have, we have six. Yeah. We adopted six books. There's a website that the Smithsonian Libraries has for adopt a book. It's really cool. We used to have an event twice a year where you could go and actually see the books and choose. I'm sure that'll start back, you know, you know, when all this is over with in 22, probably it'll start back again. But right now they're online. You can find them and you can adopt a book. Really neat. Second way 
to do it coming up. Um, when we moved here, uh, we moved to, to uh, Orlando a couple of months ago. I used to have a whole bunch of stuff hanging in my house, all kinds of prints and pictures and things from all around the world. I couldn't bring them all down here. They just wouldn't fit. They just don't yeah. fit. So I gave them to Esther who works for me and she put together an auction. And there's gonna be an auction starting November 28th uh, where you can bid on those. And every dime that comes from that will go to the Smithsonian libraries as well. Yay. So that's another way to kind of help out. Yeah. So keep the libraries in mind. They need your help. You can also just donate money. You can do that too. You can do that too. It's all kinds of ways, but it's more fun to adopt a book. Yeah, it's adopt a book is really adopt cool. Adopt a book is really yeah. a lot of fun. And if you like, you know, artwork or if you like Steve's books, these are things we've gotten all over the world from all the research trips. So. And they fit. And I signed the back of everything, so everything yeah. is signed. Some of it's framed, some of it's not. So keep all that in mind. Thank you for coming. And the Smithsonian Library is just going to send you a link. Yeah, you're going to get to a link. The They're going to send you a special email with yes. a link with all that yeah. on there. So, so thank you for coming. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, and stay safe. Yes. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much, so, so much, Stephen Liz, for being here and for taking extra time today with us. I know that everyone, I mean, there are so many messages about how awesome this has been. And, um, you know, I wish we could stay on for, for longer, but I, I know people have to get back to reality. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, like Stephen Liz said, we're, we're going to send out some some follow-up, um, including that C-SPAN video and, um, you know, links to, there are some things in the chat, but we'll send them out as well for adopt a book and um, a little bit in the future, once the, the auction is up and running, we'll, we'll share that as well. And um, again, thank you all so much for being here. Um, we, we have a short survey for you to fill out if you'd like to share your thoughts after, after we end this evening. And um, we hope you enjoyed being with us and uh, have a great evening and uh, stay safe and, and healthy and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.